Hello, everyone. This is the FPS Sample Networking Deep Dive Talk. I'm Peter, and uh, today we'll go over the uh, netcode of the FPS sample. And the talk is being recorded, so I just want to put this note in that if you are listening to this from the future, be aware that uh, this is correct information as of time speaking at Unity 2018.3 beta 6. The sample project is something that will change over time, so um, um, yeah, keep an eye on our GitHub repository if you want to keep up on that. So um, I want to start by just giving you a quick uh, video for those of you who didn't uh, catch the keynote yesterday about what the sample game actually is about. I have 40 seconds here that I failed to start, but it will come this time maybe. Yes. Okay, so this is a project that's a full project that's available for you to download and open in the editor and try around with. I guess that gave you a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about here. Um, yes. Okay. So uh, many of, of you have actually over the years said uh, things like Unity should try and make a game. It would change things. And uh, I'm here to report, yes, it did change things and it will change things. Uh, I want to, before I start talking about Netcode, just go over a few of the goals of uh, this project. Um, of course, we wanted to build a first-person shooter in Unity, and wanted to do it in a way where we used the new HD render pipeline to do fast-paced or like fast-performing uh, stylized uh, content. And then we wanted to make it in a way where all the source and the assets were something that was actually available to pass on to you so you could use it as a starting point. It means that uh, the source code is not using uh, anything that you could not use in your own projects, and the same goes for all the assets. Um, then we found out that this was also super useful uh, as for a number of other reasons. So dog fooding, for example, uh, internalizing user pain, testing new features at scale, uh, and in general, just having a good feedback loop with R&D. So I know this may sound unfair to some of you, but I actually work in Copenhagen and have a chance to eat lunch with the R&D people of Unity every day. It means that I actually get to say to them, your stuff doesn't work. Um, and it also means that they get to say to me, I'm, you're doing it wrong, so then I can try and fix it, of course. But I think it's a pretty healthy feedback loop that also is informing some of Unity's future development simply by um, showing in a very clear way some of the problems that we run into. And then the last thing is definitely, and that's the reason why I wanted to make sure uh, the rights uh, for all the content is like it is. We hope that this can be something that can bootstrap some of your projects Either because you take the full thing and build right on top of it with your like cool features ideas, or maybe you're doing something that's uh, somewhat different from a first-person shooter, but maybe there's still some tooling or some low-level or high-level code that you can just you know steal. It's a good uh, it's a good place to take a look, I think. So just to give you a sense of scope, uh, we are six people in uh, in uh, Copenhagen: uh, technical art director, technical animator, environment artist and two programmers. And then we have uh, contractors for some concept work and uh, um, sound and uh, a lot of the 3D meshes, actually. So we have a few ground rules um, that we work by. No asset store stuff, and that's not because we're against it. It's just because we want the experience for you guys. When you download it to be, you can hit play, and you can go right into it without having to buy maybe some other uh, middleware. We want it to be on vanilla Unity, uh, so no uh, local modifications. The game works on, uh, actually also on beta 6, uh, six I put uh, beta 7 up there, but it didn't really work on beta 3, so we only barely made it. But it does work on the latest beta that is out publicly. Um, I scratched out no hacks because we have a shipping mentality that kind of trumps that. So uh, if a workaround is needed, it is found in the source code, and we will then try to remove the reason for it 
uh, its necessity. And this is a little bit about the content. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. Um, but uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, the netcode aspect of it. So we'll be covering a lot of ground. And uh, I think 45 minutes maybe is a little bit optimistic to try and do all this. But I have this unique opportunity that I can simplify things a little bit and then basically quote chapters and words to where in uh, the source code of this handy project uh, you can go and look. So in some way, I could actually say, well, you can set a breakpoint at the top of game.cs. That's the main loop. And then we could all go and have coffee because everything you can find from just stepping there. But I will do a few more details. But I have left some notes here and there where there are relevant files you can go and check out or functions that kind of gives more detail on some of the things I, I mentioned. Finally, I just want to mention that this is not something that we have invented. This is actually pretty uh, proven techniques, I believe, that has been widely used in many shooter games and was pioneered many years ago, actually. But the details are not always super um, well documented, uh, and maybe rarely you can find it in a, like in a, in a full product like, uh, like this. So a few um, sort of like assumptions I'm going to make. I, don't, I hope that nothing on this slide scares you except my programmer art. You should know about the internet, IP addresses, um, maybe even about TCP and UDP. If not, we will, you will be able to catch up. Uh, you probably also know that this cloud is used to signify the internet for strange reasons. Um, but I will kind of assume you know that. And then I'll talk about how we built uh, a shooter game like this. And the core idea is actually pretty simple. We have the client uh, running the game. That's an traditional Unity game that has rendering and sound and all that stuff. And then we have the server, which we call the headless server. It's because it doesn't have any rendering. It is running in a cloud somewhere. And they talk using UDP packages. The client is sending more frequently than the server is sending. The client is sending uh, what we call user commands uh, containing what it wants to do, mouse and uh, keyboard input. And the server is sending out the updates of what is happening in the world. Just to be clear, this uh, animation, of course, is in uh, super slow motion, but also the distance between the client and the server is also very not to scale. So in real life, I would say we have maybe like, think of it like it's a round trip time. It's a term I'll be using of maybe 100 milliseconds. It's kind of like the, some people would say it's like ping. So that's the sum of the travel time going from the client to the server and back again. So one of the problems is the internet. Right? That's, the, that's what is causing this to not work as simple as we would like. And we'll take a look at a single UDP package in flight, traveling all alone on the internet. And if we zoom in and look inside the packet, we can see a few things that some of you might al already know. There's a header that contains a bunch of uh, data. Two of them have highlighted, which is the source and destination IP address. And then, of course, then some, some, uh, some of our user data that we are, we are sending in this package. So it's traveling from the IP number in the bottom to the IP number at the top. If you do a reverse lookup, you will see it's traveling from Unity to Multiplay, meaning someone in the office is probably gaming. So a lot of stuff could happen to such a um, packet in flight. There are some dangers on the net that is worth knowing. For example, we have duplication. A packet might suddenly split into two, uh, going through a router that is misconfigured or for some other reason end up arriving in two copies on the receiving end. There's also the problem of reordering. One packet might take a slightly faster route than another one and they will arrive out of order on the receiving end. And then, of course, we have packet loss. For some weird reason, there might be monsters on the internet or whatever, you will lose packets from time to time. Uh, overworked router or something will decide to toss away a few packets. Some of them are yours. And, uh, and now, of course, you have a, a problem. And then I didn't even mention on this list fragmentation, which is a problem with larger UDP packages. We're just going to forgo that completely and say, we'll design a solution where all our UDP packages are small enough for that to not be a problem. So when using UDP, assume nothing is basically uh, the rule, which leads to this very natural question. Why, again, was it we did not use TCP? Because that has all the nice properties. And the thing is, it delivers reliability, but it comes at the price of latency. 
So last or reordered or duplicate packets, as we just saw before, will stop the stream. And that's kind of okay if you're watching a movie. That's the best thing that you don't want to happen, but if you have network problems, you actually would like the movie to pause until you are caught up. So for streaming and stuff like that, it's probably a good idea. For computer game on the internet or multiplayer, maybe not so much. Maybe I'm losing the packet that said uh, I got a kill, which of course is annoying, but I definitely do not want to wait for the stream to catch up before I get information about that incoming rocket. I want it right away, uh, and then I don't mind so much about I missed information about the kill. Um, so I think in this case, the best plan is basically just to soldier on with the UDP and then try and fix the problems. Or at least, I will see, just try and find a way to detect the problems. So we're gonna look at how can we detect duplication, detect reordering, detect loss, and then measure the round trip time, which, and all of these things are kind of like the conditions that we have to uh, create a good uh, experience under. So to battle reordering and duplication, we use a sequence number. Uh, by doing that, it's pretty simple. The receiver, of course, can detect out of order packets or duplicates, and they can decide what to do, throw them away maybe. We do that simply by adding a sequence number that is constantly increasing to all the outgoing packages. And then there's a lost packet detection. What do we, how can we do that? Well, we um, are simply going to add even more uh, data. We'll add each packet will now have not only its own sequence number, but it will also have the sequence number of the last seen packets from the other side. So let's take a look at the red packet. It's traveling north towards the server from the client. And it says, I'm number 123, but the last incoming packet from you, the server, was packet 54. And likewise, the other way around. And then we want to be a little bit uh, more detailed. So we actually also add a bit mask about the previous 16 packages. So we call it the ACK mask. And it means these bits that 54 is like the base that was received because there's a one there. It the, means that packets 53, the one that came before that, was at least not at the time of sending of this package, was not received. So I put a question mark because we don't know if it was lost, we just, don't, we just know it wasn't received yet. And so on and so forth down there, it seems like all the other ones actually made it across in, uh, in fine form. So the server cannot, in this case, when it receives this red packet, cannot really conclude that 53 was lost, but if it keeps receiving packages from the uh, client, and this zero, the yellow zero, kind of like wanders all the way down, well, in that case, you basically end up having to conclude it was lost when it falls off the end. Then there's the RTT measurement, finding out what is the round trip time, and that's actually done in a pretty simple way. The client, and it's done from both sides, but we'll look at it from the client. The client keeps a watch, it's down at the bottom, it starts at a thousand milliseconds. And when it's sent a packet, it will record what is the time when it's sent it. When this packet arrives at the server, maybe 50 milliseconds has passed. The server will then, a little bit later, send out one of the blue packages. And as part of that package, not only will it send the sequence number of the packet, the sequence number of the last acknowledged packet, it will also send the time since the acknowledging acknowledged packet, so in this case 122, was received. So you could say that the red packet arrived at the server and then 30 milliseconds later we are sending out the blue one. So now 100, or now, now the clock on the client reads uh, 1080. This one will probably travel for uh, uh, 50 milliseconds still. Yes, it does. And it receives, it received on the client uh, when the clock is 1130 milliseconds. So now a simple subtraction can calculate the round trip if we uh, use the fact that we know this was kind of sitting on the server for 30 milliseconds. This happens on both ends of the communication, so both ends are keeping track of what is the round trip time. And in the sample game, we, we do this measurement on every third packet, but you could, you could configure it uh, differently, I guess. Um, yes, let's see. Here, good. So in some way, we kind of solve the, or at least now are able to detect the low-level problems, the UDP uh, sort of side of things. So let's go about with this in mind or in hand to try and build uh, 
the actual loop. So we, for simplicity, many of these things can be configured or be different, but for simplicity, let's assume the server is ticking at a rate of 60, and the client is running at a steady 60 frames per second in this case. And the client will send out, at every frame, it will send out the user command, is the red packages. It contains stuff like uh, movement and uh, mouse and jump and sprint and other uh, action buttons and so on. And at any given time, many of these packages would be in flight to the server. 60 of them per second are being sent. The server, on the other hand, sends out uh, a snapshot. We call it a snapshot. It's uh, another way would be to say it's like the entire world state. And it's only sending these 20 times per second in the default configuration. So this is the loop. And we'll take a look at what could possibly go wrong. Because when you, when you explain this to people who are even haven't really done any network programming before and just you know, ask them, so do you think it will work? They will, after a little while, come up with a couple of interesting problems that could uh, happen. I will give you a hint. I guess you can uh, maybe imagine that some of the things could go wrong, right? So what if some packets are dropped? What, what, what would be the consequence? How do we deal with that? How exactly are you going about fitting an entire world state, in, state into a single UDP package? It's a bit of a claim that I can do that. And these blue packages, they only arrive at 20 times per second, so will all the players and rockets and so on, will they sort of like move in a, in a stuttery way? Will my own movement be sluggish? Because there's like round trip time. If I hit W, I would like to be able to move right away, not after a full round trip. And similarly, do I have to lead the target when I'm shooting with a hit scan weapon? I think all of these are very reasonable um, sort of uh, questions. And we will try and look at the how we can construct the full loop and keep an eye on these problems and see if we solve them as we go along. So if we start by looking at the top of the loop and we look at the server, because in some way, the server is actually most similar to a traditional game. It just doesn't have a keyboard and it ha doesn't have a screen. But other than that, it has an update loop and it's uh, like moving ahead the state, moving around everyone, making sure that the correct uh, people get uh, awarded points or whatever it is in your game. So in place of having a keyboard, the server is uh, taking in commands from the net and they arrive at the server uh, one at a time and is stored in what we call the command queue. So here we have actually now two commands from the client stored in the command queue. And then the server goes tick, and it will execute uh, the simulation that goes with tick number 91. And that's very fortunate, because the command that matches uh, 91 has arrived. But oh no, in the horizon we see other packages arriving. Will they make it? And actually, let me just go back one, because if they don't make it, what then? The server has to proceed its tick. And in our game, we simply have to make some assumptions, and we will assume that the player is doing nothing, just not moving, not shooting, not anything. You could make other guesses, maybe doing the same as last uh, tick or whatever. We, we assume nothing. But in this case, we're in this weird situation where the packages are arriving out of order, and number 92 arrives. Kind of inconvenient, because what we need is 91. But fear not, because we know that UDP is not to be trusted. We are actually stuffing in four different user commands in each of these packages. I put them in parentheses because like the top one is the, the one that is like the most recent and then the four older ones. They are delta compressed against each other so they actually don't uh, take up that much uh, space. So now in this case we are actually able to have all the commands in time for tick 99 to execute. So now let's talk about how the server can sort of like push on the result of this frame to the clients. We claim that we would like to try and fit an entire world in a UDP packet, and then we will try and see how we can go about do that. But let's ignore, um, let's kind of ignore the, the size limit initially, um, and, and talk about how we will do it. We'll think of it like we go through all the entities in the world. Some of them will be dynamic, or we call them replicated, so it means that they need to be communicated to the client. Most entities do not, of course, walls and floors and so on. But those that have uh, properties that need to be communicated to the client, uh, we will have to serialize out like this. So in this case, there are three entities in the world. 
two rockets and a player, and they have some uh, properties here. So let me just try and rewrite it a little bit and simplify and write it in sort of like the same thing in a different way. I now write a list of entities saying I have entity one, that's a player, 28, a rocket, and 29, nine, nine also a rocket. Now I can look at my data just in like in one stream because I know that a player is containing health position name, so I could skip over those and arrive at the rocket and so on and so forth. So I can understand this data stream because I know which entities they sort of, um, it, it, it matches with. So um, one interesting observation that you can make uh, is if you are uh, taking your game 60 times per second or sending out updates 20 times per second, a lot of stuff is not changing. So I have here a snapshot made of the world from TIG 88, another one made from 91, and not a lot of stuff was changed. It's the same amount of entities, the same entities. My health is still 100, fortunately. And the only thing that's actually moving seems to be the rockets. They are traveling ahead uh, out of the C-axis. Um, now, remember that both sides in this sort of like uh, uh, loop is keeping track of what arrived on the other side. So we actually know from this ACK mask thing, uh, when we are the server, we know what the client have already seen. So what if the, the client already have snapshot 88? Maybe we could use that as an opportunity to do some sort of delta compression so that we can send out uh, information about uh, the new snapshot, kind of referring to the old one. So our new structure, our revised structure for the snapshots is like this. We have a baseline that says, this snapshot is supposed to be seen as a delta to related to, to snapshot 88. Let me assume the client have. There are a list of spawned new entities. This is empty in this case. And then there's a bunch of updated data. And now, of course, I know I have a lot of uh, lines on the screen here. It looks like a bad uh, Git merge or something. Uh, but what you hopefully can see is that there's actually only two values that change. I can just say skip four or skip one or whatever and skip over the data when I'm going to send out my update. The client will be able to reconstruct everything from this. Also, there is uh, no despawns in this uh, um, snapshot compared to 88. So now we have this new structure. And I guess that uh, most of you will agree that it's, it's likely that what will take up most bandwidth is the update data. Of course, it will be spawn and despawn indices, but it's just a few ints. So, uh, and the update data will contain many more things than just a few positions, and some of them will change. So this, let's just remind ourselves again that this data is coming from this stream of data. And maybe we can do something um, a bit about that. If we, if we take a look, or let me put it like this, so, so the next slide is just about this data bit. Let's forget about the spawn and despawn and all that bookkeeping, and I would just talk about the data stream there. So let's recap the situation. The server has made a tick and has now produced a snapshot of the world in tick 91. Now, what the server could do is it could say, wow, I actually have on store the old snapshots. In this case, 82, 85, and 88. And it's not by random I picked those, because I picked those uh, because the server knows that the client also have seen these. So now the server can run a prediction function and can create a prediction of what frame 91 likely would look like, given we have 82, 85, and 88. So if you have uh, stored somewhere in your game, maybe uh, time, that is an integer that is constant, continuously growing, a predictor would actually be able to predict pretty well how that will go. The rocket we saw before, it seemed like it was traveling in pretty much a straight line, so it would be able to pick up that it seems like uh, it is, it is uh, like, uh, it is quite predictable how the next position will be according to the previous one. And my health, of course, it's 100. I hope it's very predicted, predictable that it will stay 100 for a long time. So I create this prediction, but it might not be correct. So now I subtract the prediction from the real state, and I get what we call a delta state, 
which has hopefully lots of zeros in it. So because it has lots of zeros, we can compress it really, really well, and we can send it to the client, who in its own turn has the same snapshots that we talked about before, because it had acknowledged them. It can run the prediction code, produced because it's the same code and the same data, so we will assume it produces the same, very same green, uh, hopefully optimistic uh, prediction of uh, tick 91. And then it can do sort of like the vice versa or a calculation and arrive at the correct state 91 and use it uh, in the game. And not forgetting, storing it. Because now on, since it will now have acknowledged this packet as in the next outgoing packet, it could get a packet from the server that is using 91 as a baseline. Okay. So to recap, this is how we fit a snapshot. It's basically, this is basically the structure that you would find in sample game. Uh, we have the baselines, we're using three baselines. Um, that's actually a thing that I haven't seen in so many other games. I have actually not seen it in a game uh, before. And it gave us a nice and uh, beef, I think, 30% uh, performance uh, boost in terms of compression to go from just a single baseline to actually use a predictor and three baselines. Then we have something called schemas. And we have the list of spawns and the list of despawns. And in between, the beefy part, the update list, where all the little dot, 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 three dots there are the ones that are delta compressed from using the system we saw here. Okay. So let's take a sort of like a recap. Where are we with uh, all these problems with the uh, network communication in uh, using UDP? We have I, a little bit uh, uh, unfair, maybe. I put green out of uh, what if packets are dropped. We at least looked into what if the red packet gets dropped. We'll uh, need to remember to check out what should happen if the blue ones get dropped. And we have argued, or at least shown, how we can um, fit an entire world in a UDP packet. So let's continue and take a look at it, if we can make it work on the client without some of the other problems showing up. So we want to have smooth world movement. And by world, in a, in a multiplayer game, I basically mean everything that's not myself, the first person, the character. So that could be uh, other players, uh, rockets, uh, moving platforms, whatever, stuff that is uh, moving around in the world. And this is seen from the client viewpoint. Below, I have a timeline that is the, um, the individual frames on the client. Remember, it's running at 60 frames per second, so I will now hit uh, button and I get the next frame, little one down there. And then I get another frame. And this frame, there actually happened to be a blue packet arriving. You remember the pack packages from the servers arriving uh, 20 times per second, so not every frame. I'm just gonna go quickly back and then you can see what happens. So this, this guy on the screen there is actually moving uh, as he's moving pretty fast or is a significant step. The next frame, he's not moving though. And the next frame, he's not moving either though. And then I receive another update and then he moves by a big hop again. And that is exactly what I was worried would happen, because this is not good. I will get not a smooth movement. I will basically see someone just going along at, at 20 uh, hertz. So this, this cannot stand. We have to find another way to fix this. And the idea is, let's try and make a frame after 84, and let's try and make it a nice frame, a smooth frame. So we have to do something else. We introduce what we call a client-side interpolation, and the and purple marker there is like this, the, the amount of interpolation. So we go a little bit back in time and find a nice spot between two updates from the server, in this case between 78 and 81. And in there, we make an interpolation between the position of the uh, other guy that, where he was at 78 and the position where he was at 81. And then from that interpola interpolation, we draw the, um, uh, the guy on the screen. And then the next frame, we do the same thing. And you can see now he actually moves with only a little bit because we are not limited to the granularity that the update rate of 20 hertz is. We can actually create as many interpolations as we wish. So as a parenthesis, even though I said that we're running 60 frames per second, if we were running much faster on the client, we could still produce very finely um, intermediate values for the um, uh, position of this guy. Okay. 
Um, so I think that kind of solves the problem of not smooth world movement. But for the not world, so that is the first person character. So that's me, very important. I want to have smooth movement as well. And that's where we use a technique called client-side prediction. It's not a, it's not a term I'm super um, happy with basically because it's actually not predicting as much as it's simply allowing the first person, uh, m my first person character in the game to move ahead of the uh, server state, kind of hoping to get, you know, uh, forgiveness rather than permission in some way. So let's take a look. From the client perspective, again, we are arriving, we have arriving updates from the server roughly every three frames. And um, we do the world uh, interpolation stuff uh, that we talked about on the previous slide. We, that's, not, that's not shown here. Then let's like, take a look at this particular frame. Let's freeze time here and see what would we, what can we do with my local character, the first person character. And what we do is we allow just the first person character, not everything else in the world, just the first person character, we allow uh, that character to replay past movement commands, so mouse and keyboard inputs. And that way it can sort of like do a number of simulation steps. So think of this as you have the entire world, but then you're running only the bit of code that is updating the player character, only that bit of code which is shared between server and client is being run now, one tick at a time, replaying past user commands. Question is, of course, how fast, far out in the future should I do this? And if you remember the sort of like the mental picture, I have it like up in the right corner, so it doesn't have to be a mental picture, but it's an actual picture. Uh, we have a round trip of 100 milliseconds, or that translates into six ticks with our current speed. So if I were to think about what time is it on the server now, I just, this frame, received a message from the server that was tagged with tick 84. And I know it must have taken that blue packet three ticks to arrive. So I'm now guessing that the server is probably at tick 87 right this moment. But if I were to send something to the server right now, it would not arrive immediately. It would arrive after 50 milliseconds or translated roughly to three ticks. So if I send something right this moment, it will arrive at the server when it is about to make tick 90. And you saw before on one of the animations the, uh, the dangers of arriving late to the tick party on the server. You Maybe your shot will be ignored or something like that. So I'm gonna say I would like to be able to this very moment send the player command for tick 92, just to give myself a little margin so I can sit in that uh, uh, command queue for a little while. So, 92, let's just go out there in the future, hoping that uh, what we do will not be countered by the server at a later point. Now I can create my uh, new input packet, so I create a new, uh, read the keyboard and mouse and generate uh, a packet that I'm sending off to the server and storing locally also, so I can replay it again later. There it goes. And the question is then, what do we do next frame? And this is where there are some different choices, but what we have chosen to do in the FPS sample is to do what you would call a full rollback. So we roll back the entire state of the player, first person player, all the way back to uh, the last received data from the server, in this case, frame 84. But this is the next frame, right? So we are now at frame 85, so to speak, and it means we need to do our calculation all over again and say the server is now probably at 88, and if we send something now, it will arrive at 91, and I want to have my usual safety margin. So I would like to predict all the way to 93, and then send off that packet. So if we take stock of where we are, um, we've kind of like covered uh, a bunch of the problems. I should probably just go real quickly back and say a few words about drop packages. Let me just quickly do that. If for some reason we have dropped blue packages, then we will get holes in the stream here and we can kind of counter that by increasing the purple uh, interpolation size. If I increase that some more, I go even further back in time. And then I can kind of survive missing 
uh, more packages. But it's not a pleasant thing, and it has definitely also some consequences for your uh, like, uh, game experience. So we are still sensitive to package loss on the blue side, but we, can, uh, we have a way of sort of like not just you know, stopping um, completely. Okay, let me fast forward to here. Um, then the question is, do I have to lead the shots? So if I'm firing with a uh, hit scan weapon, I would most definitely expect that when I have uh, one of you sort of like firmly in the crosshair, I can you know, shoot and it will um, give me a point. So let's take a look now. We're back on the server again. So this is the viewpoint looking into the server world. This is, again, some uh, uh, very pretty programmer art. It's supposed to be a top-down view of me and my nose facing towards my crosshair. And then there's also the enemy, the gray, shady guy over there. And uh, you may ask uh, reasonably why uh, my aim is so horrible. Um, but before you judge me, uh, let's remember that what is going to happen in this frame is that I have just the server has just received user command 92 from me, and in it is the command to fire my weapon. But when I send this command 92, let's just remember how things look on the client. So this is a combination of the previous slides from the client. We have both uh, a sort of like the, the, the first person, like the client side prediction that is going ahead of 84. And as you remember, that is going roughly uh, as, as far ahead as the full round trip time. And then we have the uh, purple one that goes sort of like back in time uh, for interpolation purposes. So it means that actually what I saw on screen at my crosshair was my hands at 92 against a backdrop of the world that is 180 milliseconds old. So. That is why I am aiming where I am. But the server fortunately knows this and can now do what is called lag compensation because the server keeps a circular buffer of the history of all the players' collision boxes uh, for the last 128 frames or something like that. So the server knows that what the round trip is and it knows what my interpolation time is because I'm constantly updating a server with what is my current interpolation time. And then it can simply pull back the enemy using the history buffer to the point where it was, well, where I saw it when I fired the shot. And then I can actually fire the shot and trigger the headshot, right? I don't know, there must be some problem. Uh, it is it's supposed to be a headshot, of course, right? Uh, I don't know what, there must be a problem in the computer program or something that makes me miss. But anyway, you get the point. I should be able to make a perfect, perfect uh, headshot here. So I will kind of conclude that we've sort of uh, solved these problems. And now we have a nice playing experience. And if we, if we, um, if you want to recap this, I would like to show you some of the um, some of the things that we've seen here in theory. I would like to show you that in practice in, in the sample game. But before we do that, let me just do a quick check on time. Okay, I think we have time for this. So I just I have one more slide of a few sort of like loose ends that are kind of like decisions we made in this game that uh, can be done many different ways, but it's useful for you if you're going to dig into it to, to know about. So as you can see here, we are ticking the players with the world. It means that we are storing the user commands on the server side until the time is ready for the server to do its tick. And then it's do it does one update that covers both everything that happens in the world and the players. That's a choice you can make differently, but we are ticking with the world. Give for slightly simpler code, it means that you should probably not try and configure our game to maybe have a tick rate on the server of maybe 10 or something low like that. So it's kind of like, I think as computers have grown faster and we are more expecting to have a, a server tick rate that is more than 10 or 20, this method will probably take a while, I'm thinking. That's my, my gut feeling. Then, in this example, I always said that we're taking the server at 60 frames per second and, it's, and this, the client is running at 60 as well. 
Of course, the client you have no control over. They will run at whatever uh, they can or want, depending on quality settings and uh, hardware. But a lot of them will run at 60. A lot of people will run at, at a VSync enabled frame rate, which means it's actually a uniquely bad choice for you, I guess, to run your server at 60. If you want to run it at 60-ish, you should maybe run it at 58 or 62. And the reason is that if you have these two uh, like ticks happening where uh, client is going at 60 and server is going in at 60 and they need to keep track, then you will constantly get into a, a little phase where the, uh, the sort of like the client will have to predict two extra frames and then zero extra frames and then two extra frames and zero extra frames for a little while. It's better to have them a little bit off. Another sort of very pra practical uh, but uh, interesting thing we've, we've found out is that we want our server, which is a headless server, to run with the lowest possible uh, CPU usage, of course. And that means in, in Unity that uh, you, don't, you, you can't throttle the server on, uh, on vSync because there's no, there's, there's no monitor, there's no uh, graphics card. So you use application.target frame rate, but application.target frame rate currently is actually drifting a little bit in the sense that if you sit it, set it at 60 and it runs for an hour, it will not have run, it, it will sort of drift off. And what we do is basically we just keep track on that with a high performance counter, and then we simply not target frame rate a little bit back and forth, so we are actually constantly saying that the target frame rate is a little bit below or a little bit above our intended tick rate on the server. And it's a very simple, it's just 10 lines of code, it's in the sample game, you can uh, take them if you would like, and it actually means that we get completely driftless um, execution, and as good as possible CPU um, utilization, because when you do application target frame rate, Unity will actually sort of sleep until it gets close to the time that you do a tick and then uh, do a busy wait in the last, uh, last, the last one. We do the full rollback, as I talked about. Every frame we roll back, this, the user, um, the first person um, tracks all the way back, and that is how we get um, mispredictions to be overruled by the server. So then if there is a new a snapshot arrived, you will go from there on, maybe having received a push from a rocket or something. And the last thing we do that is not shown here is that we actually calculate internally with fractional ticks. So because we want the server and a client to not, to, we want this prediction to work in the sense that if there's no out from coming force like a rocket, the client should be able to predict its movement and the server should agree. So they need to run the same code and they need to run fixed frame rate, otherwise it wouldn't work, or tick rate. But maybe you have a gamer PC and you want to run at 144 uh, frames per second or something, and it's kind of annoying if your client is then capped to 60. So what we do is that we actually on the client run full um, 16 milliseconds or whatever your game is configured to, full ticks, and then in the end we run a little extra tick, a fractional tick that is bringing it just to about the right time. Let me, I think I'm, I, I have, well, have I on time? Three minutes, okay. So questions will be uh, outside near the Q&A uh, table. I am going to show you one last thing because I think we should have a little bit of actual execution, can't be all slides. Uh, I'm just gonna boot up the sample game here and um, I will start a, at a small level, so we're not, oh, could you turn down the music and cool? So, let's gonna create a game at this little level here, and like this. Thanks. Okay, so I just wanted to show a few uh, game tools I'm gonna kill it here. Oh, good, thanks. No? Okay, so we, we will do it like, Yes, blissful. Okay, so I just want to show you uh, one of the um, uh, sort of like very informative uh, stats here, which is uh, this. I hope you can see a little bit of it. Um, so this is our in-game um, stat screen. And if you paid attention to the colors, you will notice that a lot of the colors here matches the colors on my, my slides. We have the red dots in the bottom here, that's actually the incoming packages, sorry, the outgoing packages from the client. And it's almost like an unbroken line 
because it's sending out a package every frame. The blue ones are the incoming packages from the headless server. They are there roughly uh, every third frame, as we would expect because it's ticking at 20, uh, sending out at 20 hertz. Then we have a bunch of other stuff up here. We have like the, the whatever, light blue here. It's like the round trip time. Very nice, it's on localhost, so the only round trip is actually waiting for the next tick to go. And you can see here the result of our fancy compression, which is that we have a total uh, downstream usage of 300 bytes per second. So that means 60 bytes in each package. But actually most of it is headers at this point where, where nothing is happening. Uh, so we have the payload here is only um, around 30 bytes per packet or something like that. So of course if you then start to um, move around and, uh, and uh, you know, shoot some uh, bullets and do stuff, I can make it go up and it will reach maybe around a, a K uh, per second. But that's still pretty, pretty good. Uh, and that's because of all that uh, compression we did, uh, we did before. You can also tell uh, from uh, the, oh, sorry, the, the green um, numbers up there that currently I'm around two commands in queue on the server, which uh, is what I want. In order to uh, hit that, I have the frame time scale all the way at the top that I notch up and down to make sure I uh, sync with the server time. I think my time, speaking of time and sync, is up. So I hope you enjoyed it. I encourage you to check out the, the sample game. I would like to remind you that we have, uh, we have a booth at the expo floor uh, where we can uh, talk more about the sample game. There are some links here. This is uh, the photo slide. And uh, I will be at the Q&A table uh, right after this. Thank you. <laughs>